All right, so last time uh, we began, or maybe two times ago, we began a discussion of various vocabulary and facts you have to know about the markets if you want to think about finance. Today we're going to deal mostly with the most important one, the most basic one, the yield curve. And last time we introduced this word yield. Now, yield is an extremely common expression in finance, and it turns out not to be that um, well-defined often or that useful, and it, but the word is so important, has been used so often that it still hangs around even when probably we should use different uh, concepts. So remember the yield was an attempt to look at an investment and without paying any attention to the market or anything outside the investment, just looking at the investment itself, try to assess, give a number quantifying how attractive the assessment was. Uh, attractive the investment was. So we said you could apply that to a bond, it has cash flows, you could apply it to a hedge fund that's taking in money and paying out money. And uh, the formula we came up with said that if the cash flows are given by C1, C2, the net cash flow, CT, over the course of the uh, period, then, uh, and its price is some minus, uh, you know, some price, P0, maybe it's a, it's a negative cash flow, so C, so some of these cash flows might be negative and some of them might be positive, then we should just look at the number Y such that discounting all these things at rate Y gives you zero. And the Y that did that was what we defined as the yield of the investment. So we saw that that had some advantages. For example, in a hedge fund, if you just look at the rate of return it makes on its money every year, that doesn't take into account that some years it's got a lot more money. So if those were the years it lost money and the years when it hardly had any money were the years that it made money, um, just taking the average, the multiplicative average of all those geometric average of all those yearly rates of returns would give a misleading figure. Well, the yield also gives a somewhat misleading figure. And I don't want to spend too much time on uh, why it might be misleading, uh, but I'll give you just an example. Suppose that the cash flows happen to be 1, minus 4, and 3. Now, what's the yield to maturity? Well, there are two of them. You could have y equals 0 because 1 over 1 plus 0 plus minus 4 over 1 plus 0 plus 3 over 1 plus 0 is just 1 minus 4 plus 3, that equals 0. So the yield to maturity of 0%, uh, the yield of 0% makes this have present value 0. But also I could try y equals 200%. And then I'd have y, I'd put a plus 2 and a plus 2 squared here. And I'd have minus 1, or plus 1, minus 4 thirds, plus 1 over 3 squared is one, uh, 3 over 9, so it's plus 1 third. So it would be 1 minus 4 thirds plus 1 third, which also equals 0. So is the yield to maturity, the internal rate of return, 0% or 200%? It's ambiguous. So yield to maturity can't be the right way of doing things. To go back to the hedge fund example, you know, the hedge fund was uh, taking in money, paying out money, taking in more money, paying out money, and we calculated the yield to maturity. Well, suppose that there was some period, you know, here at which point everyone had taken all their money out. So the hedge fund wasn't actually doing anything for a bunch of years, maybe for a long time, and then it started up and, and you know, took money in and paid money out and stuff. Well, because the gap in time was very long with nothing happening, if you take a positive Y, the stuff that happens in the second incarnation of the fund is hardly going to be making any difference because by that time it'll all be discounted a lot. So the yield, the yield will depend too sensitively on uh, stuff early rather than stuff late. And so, uh, again, you get into troubles yielding just uh, yield to maturity. So that can't be the right thing to do, even though people have uh, done it for years. So the word, however, lives on, and there's no getting rid of the word because it's used in common vocabulary. Now, what would Irving Fisher say you should do if you had to summarize how good an investment was? What's his lesson? What do you do? Uh, an investment where there's no doubt about what the cash flows are going to be, what would he say you should do to evaluate the attractiveness of it? 
What's our lesson, our main lesson from Irving Fisher? What would he say? Yes. Well, let's say they're cash flows, so it's money, money that you're going to get coming in and out. Yeah, he'd say deflate by inflation and turn them into real flows and then do what? So just continue your answer. So turn them into actual, you know, potatoes every time, you know, apples each time, you know, deflate by inflation and then do what? with the numbers. This is a simple question. You're thinking too hard. Yep. Yes? Okay, he'd say just look at the present value of all these things. So of course to do that you'd have to know what is the market rate of interest with which to compute the present value. So Fisher would say it's ridiculous to evaluate how good an investment opportunity is just by looking at the cash flows. You're throwing away too much information. You know what the market is doing. You know what the interest rates are. Use the market interest rates and figure out what the uh, present value of all the cash flows is. So we're going to now um, do that a bunch of times, okay, for the rest of the class and see, see what that means. So how do you know? So we have to begin the first, the two-thirds of the class is going to be spent on the question, how do you know what the market rates of interest are? Okay, so how do you know what the market rates of interest are? How could you find out what, I mean, what the market rate of interest is? What would you do to find it out? Yeah. And if you looked in the newspaper, say, could you find it in the newspapers? What would you find in the newspapers? Yep. Okay, and so how, so all right, so yes, you try and look at riskless investments like government bonds where there can't be any default, at least that's what they always used to say, um, it can't be any default on an American uh, uh, promise, America's never broken, government never broke a promise, uh, and they can always print the money, so presumably they don't have to break a promise, so they're just promising money which they can print, so why should they ever break their promise? So. What would you find if you opened a newspaper? You would find for different maturities, um, used to be up to 30 years, for different maturities, you would find the, the yield on the various bonds. Okay, so why would you find the yield? Well, uh, the yield of various government bonds, of gov bonds. Why do they quote the yield? Well, that's just because, you know, 100 years ago, people started using the idea of yield, and so the vocabulary has is, is, uh, been uh, kept, even though it's not the best uh, way of describing what's going on. So, for instance, let's just look at some of the yield curves you might have seen over the last ten, or nine years, almost 10 years, since December 2000 you would see that in December 2000s, the yield on the one-year bonds, you know, or the, you know, the short yields were, you know, these are, this is in a log scale, so this is, you know, 3, 6, 12. Okay, so the, the shortest bonds um, usually have lower yields than the highest bonds, but sometimes, like in December 2000, the yields are almost all the same. It's called a flat yield curve. Other times, like uh, now, we're in this light blue one here, like now, the short bonds have very small yields and the long bonds have much higher yields. Okay, so the last one is the 30-year bond. So, so it's, um, okay, so you get the yield on every single bond. Now, what do you notice about this picture, by the way? They can be very different at different time periods. So in, in, de in December 2000, the interest rates were really high. The yields were 6%. I'm talking yield so far. We haven't talked about interest rates. We have to figure out what the interest rates are. But anyway, they're obviously going to be connected. So the yields were very high in December 2000, and they got much lower in December 2008, and they've stayed very low. So why are they so low now? What got them to be so low now? Yep. The Fed flooded the economy with money. It wanted to drive the interest rates down to zero. So we're going to see very soon why the Fed might have wanted to do that. But these, these money rates don't move totally on their own. 
they have to do, and we said the Irving Fisher, we haven't described Irving Fisher's theory of money and nominal interest rates, but somehow the Fed is controlling the nominal interest rates and it's changed, it's, it's changed the yield curve. So you notice that the yield curve now, December 2008, was this blue one, so the Fed in the crisis of 2008, you know, was terrified and it dropped the interest rate almost to zero, virtually zero, and it's kept it there because from December 2008 till now we're at the end of, we're, almost, we're October 2009, okay, September 30th, 2009, a long time has passed from this dark blue to the light blue line and the, and the rate has been kept fixed there. But in the intervening time, the long rates have started to go way up. Now, why might that be the case? What, what does that suggest to anybody? Does anybody know? Yep. Could, that could be one reason. And could there be another reason? Yep. Okay, so those are the two reasons. So they somehow know that, and some of you have no idea how they could possibly be thinking that. And so we're, I'm going to explain the, why, what information is is there in the different yield curves. Okay, so the point is that every morning, every single financial analyst wakes up and sees these yield curves, you know, consults the market and sees where things are trading and can produce uh, a yield curve like that. Okay, so, so you've got a bunch of yields. Now, what are the yields? Well, let's just um, do uh, an example here. So I'm going to make up an example which is very easy to compute. So let's try this one. Okay, so suppose, so I'm reading here at the top. Let's just say that um, you've got a bunch of different bonds, a one-year bond, a two-year bond, a three-year bond, a four-year bond, and a five-year bond. Now, each of the bonds was issued uh, let's say they were, you know, often they might, so I'm assuming here that they're all issued on the same day. So they're issued with different coupons. Let's say they were all issued today. We'll come back at the end. You know, obviously the, the Treasury doesn't issue new bonds every single day. So how does this change when you arrive on a day when they haven't issued things? But let's just keep it simple and suppose that today the Treasury's if issued five different bonds over these five different years. Now the Treasury has to set, how do they, what do they do? They decide how much of these bonds they're going to sell and they decide uh, you know, what coupon they're going to set. So th they set the coupon. So let's say the coupon they set was a dollar for the one-year bond, two dollars for the two-year bond, three dollars for the three-year bond, four for the four-year bond, five for the five-year bond. It's easy to remember, that's why I chose those numbers. And uh, the face value, let's say, is always a hundred. So why did they set those coupons? Well, because given how much they want to sell, they're picking the coupon, hoping that the price turns out to be close to the face value. So let's say when they actually market these and uh, supply equals demand and equilibrium, the prices turn out to be 100.1, 100.2, 100.3, 100.4, and 100.5. So 100.5 is the price the market's paying for the five-year bond, and if the coupon is five and they pay coupons once a year, they actually pay, they may pay twice a year, but let's say they pay once a year for simplicity, you're going to get five, 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 and 105 the last year. If you bought the four-year coupon bond, you'd get four, 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 104 the last year. Right? So what, okay, so those are the bonds. Now the newspaper's not telling you any of that, so you're sort of losing that information. Um, so you don't actually know that from reading the newspaper. So then, what do you know? Uh, you know that, you know the, uh, you know the, the yields on all these things. Okay, so you might, so here this tells you the yield on each of these bonds. Okay, now, um, yeah, going back to where I was. Okay, if the, you knowing the yield, you could figure out what the price of each of the bonds is, or in fact, the way that they calculated the yield that the newspapers reported. How did the newspapers get the yield? The newspaper said, well, for the four-year bond, we're going to say that 100.4, 100.4, equals 
4 divided by 1 plus the four-year yield, for the four-year coupon bond yield plus uh, 4 over 1 plus y of 4 squared plus 4 over 1 plus y of 4 cubed plus 104 over 1 plus y of 4 to the fourth. Okay, and then the in this case, because these numbers are all positive, obviously it's monotonic in y of 4. So the unique y of 4, which you can use to solve this equation, price equals the discounted value at that yield of uh, the, the, the payments. Okay, so that's how the newspapers, the reporter, that's how he got all the yields to show you that graph. He looked at the market or could call the bank or something like that, had a computer screen, you know, talked to his friends on Wall Street. He knew the price of all the bonds. He knew the coupons of all the bonds. And then he produced the yield for all the bonds. So the yield, as I say, is just, that's the word that everybody uses. But really the information that you want to deal with is the price and what did the coupon actually pay? Okay, so that's what you know. Everybody knows this every day, the information I've given. Every morning, maybe every few hours, people will update it. They'll look at what are the coupon bonds paying and what are the prices. The thing that's changing, you know, from hour to hour are the prices. But we're taking a snapshot at the beginning of the day and looking at the prices. So now we've got prices of bonds, which I'm going to call capital pies, pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4, and pi 5. But now what does Fisher say you should do? What's the most important thing to do? The most important thing to do is find the interest rates. So what has this got to do with interest rates? Well, if you modernize Fisher a little bit, the most important thing, Fisher, this is, he didn't put it this way, but this is really what he must have meant. The most important thing to do is find the prices of the zeros. So P, pi one is today's money price, today's money price, for one dollar at time one. Okay, pi two is today's money price for one dollar at time two. Pi three is today's money price at time three. And pi five is today's money price at time five. Okay, now, why do you want to find these things? Because once you know these things, you'd be able to value any investment. That original investment that we talked about, which maybe disappeared, this one, um, <laughs> it disappeared. Anyway, uh, once you have all the pies, if anybody tells you, you know, how did a, how, how, if, if a hedge fund tells you these are the pay, these are the, these are the, you know, this is the revenue I'm going to produce for you in the next five years. If they tell you, if a company says, this is our business plan, we're going to put, we're going to build a factory today that's going to cost a certain amount of money, and we're going to get pro profits in the next five years, blah, 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 blah. If uh, um, uh, a new bond comes on the market and you don't know how to price it, and somebody offers you a price for it, how do you figure out what it's worth? All you do is you take the cash flows the C's that I not very cleverly erased, you take the cash flows and multiply them by the pies. So the correct price, P, is just whatever the cash flows you're predicting times these pies that uh, Fisher says is what you should really be finding. So nothing could be simpler if you know. Now, why is this the right price? Because if you can go in the market and buy a dollar at time one for pi of one and a dollar at time two for pi of two, et cetera, you can buy all the cash flows from this investment project by spending this amount of money. So if the guy is offering you the investment opportunity at a higher price, it's crazy to do it. You could have bought those cash flows yourself by paying this price. If he offers it to you at a lower price than that, then definitely you should do it because you can, um, you know, it's a bargain because if you had to buy it yourself, it would be more expensive. In fact, you can make an arbitrage profit. If he's offering it to you at a lower price, you can buy it. And how do you buy it? By selling these very promises, C1, C2, CT, on the market. And if people believe you that you'll pay, you can sell it for this price. So you buy his project for a lower price. You sell it 
for a higher price, you make the difference, and when it comes time to keep your promises, the project is giving you the cash to keep your promises. So you lock in a profit for sure. So if you knew the pies, you would know for sure how to value and any project where you knew for sure the cash flows, knowing the pies would tell you how to value it and would tell you whether it was attractive or not attractive. You just look at how high the present value is. Okay, any questions about that? So we just figure out, we just need to figure out how to deduce what the little pies are from the data that we're going to be given and that we are given every day by the market. Okay, so I said literally, pi one is the price you would pay today to buy a dollar tomorrow. Now, how could you go about buying a dollar tomorrow, given that the only things you can trade on the market are these treasury bonds, these government bonds, and I've told you what they pay off and I've told you what their prices are. So how would you go and buy a dollar tomorrow and how much would it cost you? A dollar next year, how, how would you do that? You can trade, buy or sell any of these treasury bonds. So you know, I, I'm, I, in, I, in the background I keep saying that uh, we're gonna have to worry about people defaulting. We're not quite doing it yet. So buying a treasury bond, you need the cash to buy it. Selling a treasury bond means you promise to deliver what the treasury bond promises and you're selling it, you know, your promise is as good as the government's. So if you sell it to somebody, they'll pay you the same government price for it. So obviously in the background, you're going to have to do something to convince the guy you're making the promise to that you're going to keep your promise. So we're going to worry about that later. So for now, when I say that the market for those treasury bonds tr clears at those levels, I mean that anybody who wants to can buy treasury bonds at those levels or can sell them even if he doesn't have them at those prices by making the promise of what the treasury bond does. Because we're assuming the government and you, everybody is just as reliable. Everybody's going to keep their promise. So whether it's the treasury making the promise or you making the promise, the same thing. Okay, so how do you buy a dollar next year? What would you do in the market with the treasury bonds to get one dollar next year? Yeah. Oh, you're not. Can we just plug in one for our P and then the bond prices and then figure out uh, which bond you want to purchase? Well, um, you're supposed to be telling me. What do you want to do? I want to know exactly what to do. You can look at those numbers. By the way, are you all following these? I, I may be, this is mysterious. There's a one year uh, treasury bond that pays $101 next year. The two year treasury bond pays $2 next year, then $102. The three-year treasury bond pays three dollars the end of the first year, three at the end of the second year, 103 at the end of the third year, etc. Okay, and the one-year treasury bond happens to be selling for this price. The two-year happens to be selling for that price. So what can I do with all these bonds to buy a dollar next year? Back. All right, go ahead. You start. A two-year bond. It's next year, one year from now. I'm asking you, you're a step ahead of me. I'm saying, what do you do, never mind how much does it cost, what do you do today to get a $1 next year? What transaction can you make today, what purchase can you make today to get yourself $1 next year? Yes. Buy a one-year bond. Well, that'll give me $101 next year. I want $1 next year. Okay, well, that's exactly the point. It, uh, okay, right. I take that fraction. That's what I want you to tell me. So, pi 1 is going to be, little pi 1 is going to be 1 over 101 times the price of the one-year bond. Because the one-year bond is paying... Um, the one-year bond is paying $101. So you take one one-hundred-first of it, you'll get $1. And whatever the price of the one-year bond is, actually, we know what that is. It's 100.1. You know, you, that's how much it costs. To buy one of them costs 100.1. To get one over 101 of them costs pi 1. Okay, so this number, 
by the way, is some number. Okay, which actually uh, I, of course, worked out here. Happens to be 0.991, but we'll come back to that. Okay, so it happens to be 0.991. So now we know pi 1. Well, how would you buy $1 at time at year two, in year 2? So there's a way of directly buying $1 in year 2 once you know what the, um, how the treasuries trade. So what I'm doing is I'm explaining the idea of replication, replication, uh, pricing, that's giving me pricing, and it's going to lead to arbitrage. They're all basically going similar ideas here. Okay, so what I want to do is directly buy $1 in year two. So I could probably go to a bank and they would actually make that trade for me. I could just call up the bank and say, I want $1 in year two, and they'd tell me pi two, how much I have to pay for it. But how are they going to figure out uh, what it's worth? They're going to see how they're going to go out and have to buy the dollar for me. Uh, so they're going to go out and go to the treasury market. And what are they going to do in the treasury market to come up with my dollar in year two? They're going to replicate my purchase of one dollar with a more complicated portfolio that they, can, that they can actually trade. And that's how they're going to figure out how to price my request for one dollar in year two. So what is this bank going to do in the treasury market? What does it have to do to get one dollar for sure in year two and nothing else? Okay. Okay, so what are they going to do? How much of the two year bond should they buy? The two year bond, don't, you're not selling, you're, you're talking about the two year bond. So how much of the two year bond are they going to buy? One one oh second. That's right. That's very good. Why is that? Because in year two, we're talking about year two now. Year two, the two-year bond pays 102. If you get one over 102 of those, you've got one dollar in year two. So that's pi of two. Okay. So which happens to be 100.2. That's how much that costs. Okay, but is that all you need to do? I mean, is that it? Are you paying the right amount? Are you paying too much? Or what are you doing? You've got to do more than just that. Why is that? Yeah. Close, but not quite. Okay, so, so do your reasoning before you got to, you, you told me what else to do, which you slightly missaid. So why do you have to do anything at all? Tell me the reason why you want to do something else. You're right, you're, you're on the right track, you just slipped up a little bit. So what do you, why, do you, why not just stop here? Because you're also getting like $2. Exactly, so that's exactly right. By buying the two-year treasury, you got... 102 in period, you know, you got, well, by buying this fraction of the two year, you got just what you want in period uh, two, but you also purchased the coupon in period one, which you don't need. So that's giving you more than you needed to buy. You've bought extra. So you're going to actually be able to, to uh, the, real, the cost of getting the dollar at the end of year two is a little bit less than what we've written so far because you bought more. So far, this is buying too much. You bought the dollar in year two. You also bought a little bit in year one. You can now sell off the extra stuff you've gotten in year one to reduce your cost of buying that. So what should you do in year one? So you were, that's it's exactly what you were thinking. You just didn't quite say it right. So what should you do in year one? I sell that, okay, I sell, okay, so I can get to sell two of little pi of one, right? Because I know how much it costs me to buy a dollar, 
at time one now, it's that number. So I can say, so I'm getting, so is that correct what I've written here? That's what you said, that's not quite right, yeah? Okay, so this is what he meant to say. So that's fine, you know. It's, it's so okay, so that's what you do exactly. So everybody's following. You, you you agree with me now, right? But you know, we could simplify. We could plug in for this too, by the way. So pi of one, we know what that is. Okay, so does everybody see what's going on here? To buy a dollar at time two, you buy. Uh, you don't get the whole two-year treasury. You buy one one hundred second of the two-year treasury. So it costs you that amount of money. But that gives you a little bit of extra at time one. How much extra does it give you? Well, you've got two dollars extra for every two-year treasury. But you didn't buy a whole two-year treasury. You bought that fraction of it. So it gives you this much extra, which you now get to sell off. So you're going to sell it off for this price, pi one. And of course, we can plug in for pi one by putting 101 down here and putting 100.1 up here. OK, so that, that was pretty clear, right? So now, um, any questions about that? So that's going to be some number, which I calculated uh, again, which happens to be 96.2. 0.962. So notice, of course, it's getting cheaper to buy, you know, to, how much does it cost to buy a dollar in year one? It's that to buy a dollar in year two is less. Okay, now what about pi three? How would we get pi three? We'll stop at pi three. How would we get pi three? And then we're going to find a very fast way of computing all these numbers. What's pi three? How would you get that? Yep. So the three-year bond costs 100.3, but we don't need all of it. We just need, we don't need all of it. We need one over 103 units times that. Okay, so that's, that's our main cost. But then what else? Minus three over 103 times pi, little pi of two, right? Because we got this extra stuff that we didn't need. Okay, so he's saying minus three times 103 of pi of one. Okay, because we didn't need that. So is that the right answer? It's not the right answer, but well, it's close. So what did he overlook? So he said, you buy the three-year bond. So by buying the three-year bond, you're getting, if you bought the whole three-year bond, you get three, three, 103. You only want one at the end. So you have to divide by 103. Now we get three over 103, three over 103, one. And so he's saying, we've got two extra payments. Let's um, sell them off. And so he, sold, okay, so he sold them off like that. that. Actually, that's correct. So he sold them off. And so this one he sold off at pi 2, and this one he sold off at pi 1. So he's, he's making use of the fact that we've already found out this price and this price. But actually, that's slightly, OK, but what would you have to do? So we're talking about not what you would do talking to the banker. We're talking about what the banker would do. And he's got to trade in the treasury market. So how is this guy going to do this? The banker in the treasury market now, this pi over $2, He's going to have to hold this complicated portfolio. He's going to, what's he going to do? To, 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 uh, okay, he's going to have to combine the one and the two year to do this thing, and then the one year to undo that thing. So it's actually going to be, so in terms of trading, if you just had to trade treasuries, what would you do? So this is the correct formula. That's correct, and we can figure out what that is. Okay, and so the correct formula is, 91.68, it's 91.917. Okay, but you see what you've done is these are the kind of fictitious things that Irving Fisher has how this deduce. What you're really doing in the market is trading the treasuries. So here you've traded a treasury. You bought one over 103 units of a three-year treasury. Now what else should you do? You've got to trade treasuries. How can you sell off the, this amount of money in year two. 
you have to sell some treasuries to do that. So what would you sell? The two-year coupon bond. And so how much of that would you sell? Well, this is the amount of money you have to uh, get. And the two-year coupon bond de delivers how much money? Delivers 102. So if you did one over 100 second, you would get one. So you have to divide this by 102. OK, and that you multiply by the price by the price, which is 0.96, by, uh, by the price, which is 100.2. OK, so there's that term, right? So what have we done here? We've had to sell off this amount of money. So how can you sell off this amount of money? Well, by selling one over 100 second to your treasuries, you're selling off a dollar, but you don't want to sell off a dollar. You want to sell off something smaller than a dollar, so it's that amount. So you're selling that amount of two year treasuries. But now, now what do you have to do? Now you see you've bought some one year dollars by getting the three year coupon bond, and you've sold off some, but, you, but by selling the two year coupon bond, you've made some promises in year one. So you've got to net out all those things and do the right thing on the one-year coupon bond, right? So that looks a little complicated. But you can obviously do it by algebra. So everybody following? You're not following what the right thing to do is, but let's just say in words what we've done. In words, what we've done is we've said there are things you can actually trade on the market. Those are the treasuries. Those are our benchmark securities. Let's call them benchmarks. Now, what we're interested in is some other maybe fictitious securities or new securities. The price of the zeros. Those are the basic building blocks that will help us evaluate the present value of any investment. So the reason why we know these prices is because we can replicate them by trading only the benchmarks, only the treasuries. So to get the one-year zero, we just buy us the correct fraction of one-year treasuries. To get the two-year zero, we have to buy the correct fraction of two-year treasuries and sell the correct fraction of one-year treasuries. And that gets us that thing. So we've replicated the two-year zero by a portfolio consists of being long the two-year treasury and short the one-year treasury. Right? To get the three-year zero coupon, we have to buy the three-year treasury, sell the two-year treasury, and do something complicated that we haven't quite figured out with yet with the one year treasury and that will duplicate the three year zero and then we'll just figure then we'll just add up the cost of that portfolio that replicates this and that must be the price of that thing okay so that's what we're doing so are there any questions about that are you following this or yep time one Today is zero. So pi of one is what you pay at time zero to get a dollar at time one. Pi of two is what you pay today at time zero to get a dollar at time two. OK, so knowing those little pies, you can evaluate the, the price of anything just by multiplying the little pies by the cash flows in the future. And now the trick, this is a trick we're going to see over and over and over again, the subtlety in finance is that they don't just tell you what the little pies are. You have to figure that out yourself. Okay, and so how are you going to figure out the little pies? Well, you know that you know the treasuries. You can trade the treasuries. You know what those prices are. You can see it on the market. So by combining the treasuries in a very clever way, you can end up getting the prices of all the, the zero coupon bonds, the things that pay just a dollar at the end. Why are they called zero coupon bonds? Because it's like you just get principal at the end of one dollar without any coupons in the middle. So the, the, the little pies are called the zero coupon prices because the payments are just one dollar. You know, pi three is the price of one dollar at time three. It's as if there was a bond that paid no coupons and paid a dollar of principal at time three. So the little pies are the prices of zero coupon bonds of various maturities. And those aren't really traded directly in the market. What's traded directly in the market where you know, pieces of paper change hands are the treasury bonds. But everybody 
every day is calculating these zero coupon prices because that's what they need to do to evaluate every single project that they might conceivably do that day and decide whether it's a good project or a bad project. Is it worth the price or not worth the price? Okay, and it's done by the principle of replication, just as we said. Okay, so this formula is going to be slightly complicated. I don't know whether it's worth writing down. So we've got buying the three-year treasury, the right amount of that. Then we have to sell a certain amount of the two-year treasury, okay, because we accumulated extra coupons. But now we're also going to be able to sell a certain amount of the one-year treasuries. And so how much is that going to be? It's going to be some formula, okay? So it's going to keep track of everything we did and get a formula here. So I'm actually not going to bother, I think. I was going to write down the formula, but it'll take three minutes to work it out because there's a much faster way of getting all these numbers. But does there, is everybody with me here? How, you, you all understand how I could get this number if I wanted to do the work to get it. I'd figure out I had to sell, you know, I could, you know I'd sell some of the one year and buy back some of the two year. I'd do something complicated here. Okay, so, sorry, I, I, I would do something with the one year treasury here to compensate for the fact that the three year thing I bought is paying me coupons here. The two-year thing I sold is reducing some of those coupons, and so it's only the net coupon that I can sell, and I'm going to sell that by selling the one-year treasury. Okay, so that's how I would get the number there, and I added the cost of doing all these things together, and I get 0.917. So, um, you're silent, but are you following it? Who can I? Okay, so it's too complicated to just figure this stuff out all the time. All right, so instead, there's a very fast algorithm that you can do almost instantly, and that's why it's such a uh, triviality to calculate these numbers every day. So it's called the principle, it's the principle of duality. You go backwards, and you say to yourself, you know, um, what I want is pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4, and pi 5. And I've started to figure out what the replicating, so these are the prices of zeros, prices of zero coupon bonds, zero coupon bonds. That's what I want. Want prices of zero coupon bonds. I have the prices of the treasuries. And the way I'm figuring out the prices of the zero coupon bonds is by replication. Now, if somebody stupidly, as happened 50 and 60 years ago, fairly routinely, if somebody was willing to trade me, you know, to, to, if someone was willing to give me a dollar uh, in year three and only ask 90 cents for it, then I would have, be able to lock in a profit. How could I lock in a profit? Because I would just, he, he's willing to give this to me for a low price of 90 cents instead of 91 cents. So what can I do? Let's say he's willing to, uh, He'd, he'd pay me, let's say, more likely. Let's say he'd pay me 93 cents. Say some guy came to me, I'm the banker, and he says, I'll pay you 93 cents today to get uh, a dollar in year three. In other words, for a three-year zero. Well, I'd say, that's wonderful. I'll, I'll sell him this promise in year three of a dollar for 93 cents. Then with that 93 cents, I'll only use 91.7 of those cents, and I'll go out and buy the three-year uh, three treasury, I'll sell some of the two-year treasury, and I'll sell a little bit more of the one-year treasury, and, by doing the, and, and, and that portfolio, which I've done by doing that, will pay me exactly a dollar in year three, enabling me to keep my promise to him, but it will only have cost me 91.7 cents. So I'll have made a 1.3 cent profit for sure, with no chance, it's a pure arbitrage. I made the profit of 1.3 cents with no chance of losing any money. Okay, because I've done all the transactions today and all the government's going to keep its promises. So I don't have to worry about the government giving me the money and so I'll be able to turn the money over to that guy in year, uh, in year three. And meanwhile, he's given me his 93 cents. So if you want to do an arbitrage and make your profit, you have to figure out what the replicating portfolio is. And the replicating portfolio also tells you the price. But it takes a long time to figure out what all these arbitrage replicating portfolios are. And maybe nobody's coming to you and offering a stupid deal like that. So you don't need to figure out, so the principle of duality is you don't need to figure out 
the replicating portfolio to figure out what the pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4, and pi 5 are. I can find those numbers now just by clicking a button in Excel trivially without bothering to find the replicating portfolios. Then if some you know, bad trader comes to me and offers me 93 cents for the three-year zero coupon, then I'll figure out the replicating portfolio and take advantage of that offer to make a pure profit for sure. So I, what I want to show you now is how to get pi 1 through pi 5 without having to go through this complicated calculation. And it just reasons backwards. Okay, so please interrupt if you're not following this logic. So it, you reason like this. We don't know what pi 1 through pi 5 are, but if you did know them, you'd be able to price the very bonds that the market is trading. So you'd know that 100.1 had to equal 101 times pi of 1. And you know that 100.2, the two-year zero coupon bond, whose price is 100.2, would have to be 2 times pi of 2, uh, 2 times pi of 1, plus uh, 102 times pi of 2. Right? Because pi of 1, remember, is the price you pay today for a dollar one year from now, $101 one year from now, costs 101. If you knew pi 1, this would be the price. Okay? If you knew pi 1 and pi 2, you could figure out the price of the zero coupon bond, I mean, the two-year treasury bond, because $2 at time 1 costs 2 pi 1, and $102 at time 2 costs pi 2. And then the three year is 100.3 equals 3 times pi 1 plus <coughs> 3 times pi 2 plus 103 times pi of 3. Okay, so, et cetera. And then we can go down to the last, well, I'll just write them all. It doesn't take a second. Okay, and the last one is 100.5 equals 5 times pi 1 plus 5 pi 2 plus 5 pi 3 plus 5 pi 4 plus 105 pi 5. Okay, so you don't know the little pies, but you do know these prices because the market tells you, and you know the payoffs <coughs> of all the bonds because that's just written on their you know, that's, that's written on them, literally. So you can just read what the payoffs are. You know the government's going to keep its promise. So rather than doing this complicated stuff, trying to figure out the pies, assume you had the pies. And then if you had the pies, it would tell you what the prices of everything were. So if you guessed the wrong pies, you'd get the wrong prices. But basically, you're solving five equations and five unknowns. And that's what Excel is so good at. It's going to start with a wild guess of the pies. And then it's going to move around the pies until you match all these prices. And since it's five equations and five unknowns, you'll ha and they're all linearly independent, it'll be a unique set of pies that it'll calculate. But that one set of pies has to be the replicating portfolio prices, because <coughs> there's only one set of pies that are going to work and solve these equations, namely the ones you got by the replicating argument. So we can figure out the pies by solving five equations and five unknowns. So that's what I do. So if you write, if you guess the pies, one, 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 one. Any questions about what I'm doing? If you write one, 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 you're going to get prices you know, for the first one, it'll just be 101. And for the two year, it'll be 2 times 1 plus 102 times 1 is 104. For the third one, with all the pies 1, which is obviously not the right thing, it would be 3 plus 3 plus 3. That's 100, you know, 109. So those are bad prices. We're trying to match what the market says the prices are. OK, so all I do is I subtract the market prices we're trying to match from the actual prices. I look at what the uh, error is, which we're trying to make 0. Then I square the error. And then presumably this was adding <coughs> the error, some C16 to G16. I added the error. And so I, now I want to do my, my Excel thing. And hopefully I haven't done this, but let's, I, you know, I, it's got to work. OK, so minimize, not good, that, such that by changing cells, 
And which of the cells I want to change? I want to change the pi's. Those are the ones that are wrong. So I do that. So I'm minimizing the squared error by changing the pi's. Uh, B18, OK, and I solve. OK, and I've done it. And there is the answer. And so you notice <laughs> that I got the same prices that I told you about before by replication. <coughs> 991, 962, and 917. 991, 962, 917, etc. OK, so we got the pies. So that's step one. All right, so that's what every single financial firm in the entire world does every single morning and sometimes every single hour. So are there any questions about what we just did? You think you could do, you have to do this in the problem set. Are there any questions, is there anything puzzling you about this? Okay, now I'm going to start deducing all kinds of surprising things from this. I hope that you'll be surprised. So, but I want to make sure you've got the concept of what we've done now. A anybody puzzled by it? Okay, so somehow Fisher's pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4, pi 5 are, are going to be, uh, you know, deducible from markets, or what's going on in the markets every day. <coughs> All right, so let's ask one more thing that's deducible. Suppose I, uh, I go to a bank and say, um, I promise to give you a dollar in year two. How many dollars will you give me in year three? What do you think the bank's going to tell me? Every bank will give me the same answer if that yield curve, you know, given where, you know, this morning, and that was this morning's yield curve, if I ask every bank in the world, I'll give you a dollar in year two, you tell me how many dollars you'll, you know, be willing to give me. So I'll give you today, I'll, so what, what am I doing? I'm saying, I promise today to hand over to you a dollar in year two, and you know I'm going to keep my promise, and in exchange, I want a promise from you to give me a certain number of dollars in year three. How many dollars is the bank going to offer to give me in year three? Every bank will give the same answer, and what will that answer be? So the thing I'm asking is I'm asking for what's called the forward interest rate. Okay, so we've got these things. We're obviously very important numbers. Those are the most important things. Fisher would say those are the prices you use to get everything. But now I want to say something. Um, I'm going to ask a, another important thing, almost as important. I want the forward rate. So 1 plus I1. You can't see that. I'm glad you pointed that. Can you see this? OK. The cameraman told me this board was great. But anyway, um, so <laughs> how about 1 plus, OK, so I'll write 1 plus I1 forward is, um, uh, by the way, am I calling that 1 plus I0 or 1 plus I1? I would lift. Sorry, I just want to get my notation straight. OK, so let's call 1 plus I0 is the, uh, 1 plus IT is the, uh, Number of dollars uh, uh, at t plus one uh, in, in exchange for one dollar at t. So this is a uh, number of dollars at t plus one uh, agreed today. Okay, so we agreed today that you're going to pay this many dollars at time t plus 1 in exchange for $1 at time t. So why, this is like the interest rate that you might pay at time t. You give up a dollar at time t, how much do you get at time t plus 1? The interest rate. But we're not there yet. We're agreeing to it today. 
So today, we're agreeing to this interest rate. Okay, so what is the interest rate we'd agree to today? So we've locked in the rate. When it comes to time T, one guy's going to hand over the dollar, and when it comes to time T plus one, the other guy's going to give back this many dollars. So what is the rate we would lock in today? It's called the period T interest rate forward, because we're locking it in today for a forward period of time. But it's really just the normal time T interest rate for one year, but we're locking it in today. So what would we lock in today? What, what's that? How do we compute that? We already know what that number is. What is it? Yes? Well, I put T here. So something like that. So what? Pi T over T plus 1. Okay, exactly. That's pi T over pi T plus 1. That's it exactly. So why is that? Right. So all we're doing is this forward rate. We're exchanging time T dollars for time T plus 1 dollars at this ratio. But we're, we're committing to do it today. But today, we already know what the ratio is of time t dollars to time t plus 1 dollars. We know that pi 2 is, in fact, we know what it is. Pi 2 happens to be 962. That's a bigger number than pi 3. Two, you know, from today's point of view, a dollar time 2 is worth more than a dollar time 3. We already know how much more a dollar time t 2 is worth than a dollar time 3. It's the ratio, pi 2 over pi 3. So that ratio, as he says, pi 2 over pi 3 has to be exactly the exchange rate that the people are agreeing to today. That's, that's what pi 2 and pi 3 mean. And if you express it as an interest rate, it's 1 plus the forward interest rate at that ratio is 1 plus IFT. Okay, now, why is this... A, okay, any questions about that? That's the second... Uh, yep, go ahead. If the yield curve is downward sloping, yes. Okay, so you've made a little mistake in your premise. So the yield could, okay, so let's, let me, good question, but let me phrase your question a little differently so you see the answer to it. S the yield curve was um, almost flat in the year 2000. Okay, so in the year 2000, the yield curve was almost flat. In fact, there are moments where the yield curve seems to go down. Okay, so what is that? Uh, if the yield curve goes down, what does that mean? Does that mean that that's like between year 6 and year 7, the, year, the yield curve went down a little bit? Does that mean that pi 7 is less than pi 6? Maybe, but it couldn't really be that way. Okay, so let me translate his question. He's saying, look, yield curves very often are flat. Mostly they go up. Very often they're flat. Sometimes they even start to go down. And he said, that worries me that maybe pi 7 is less than pi 6. Okay, but that shouldn't... So that could never happen. That would be crazy because that would mean that there would be a negative interest rate in the future and with money that can never happen. You can store the money. No one's ever going to ask for a negative interest rate. He could just keep the dollar and keep it in his pocket. Okay? So why is that? So remember, pi 6 equals 1 over 1 plus the 6-year yield to the 6th power. And pi 7 equals 1 over y plus the 7-year yield to the seventh power. So it could be that y7 is less than y6 as it is there, and yet pi7 is still small. Could, could be that y7 is less than y6 as it is over there, but because you're taking this to the seventh power and this to the sixth power, you still have pi7 less than pi6. So just because the yield curve is downward sloping doesn't mean that the pi's are going down. The pi's could never go down. The pi's are always going to go up. Okay, so excellent question. Any other questions? Okay, so we could get the eyes. Now, the eyes will typically be going up. Suppose the yield curve is going up, by the way. Will the eyes be going up faster or slower than the, than the, um, than the yields? 
I, yeah, if this is the yield curve and I calculate the forwards, do you think the forwards will be going up faster or less fast than the yields? All right, well, let's do it in the example. So let's just go back to our example that we were doing. Um, yield curve spreadsheet. Okay. So maybe I did it here. Hopefully I've solved it all. Okay, so here we got the, uh, the actual pies. You see the pies are always declining. Okay, and if we uh, now look at the yield curve, you can figure out the yield. How can you figure out the yield? Because you solved that formula we gave at the very beginning. You take the price of the, I guess I've erased it now, you know, okay, you, you know what the price is. To figure out the yield on the three year, we just plug in 1 plus y of 3, 1 plus y of 3 squared, 1 over 1 plus y of 3 squared, 1 over 1 plus y of 3 cubed, and that gives us the yield. Remember, that's how the newspaper reporter figured out the yields. So I figured out the yields in the spreadsheet, okay, down here, and here are the yields. So this is what would appear in the newspaper. The one-year yield is a little under 1%. The two-year yield is a little under 2%. The three-year is a little under 3%. The four-year is a little under 4%. And the five-year is a little under, four, under 5%. Those are the yields. So what if we did the forwards? The forwards, remember, are just the ratios of these pies. What are the forwards? They're down here. So what do they do? Sorry, I don't know how I did that. Okay, here are the forwards over here. So the forwards have gone up much faster than the yields. Okay, they went from 0.008%, which is the same as that one, to 2.9, which is bigger than 2.8, to 5, which is way more than 3.8, to 7.2, which is way more than that, to 9.6, which is way more than that. So the forwards went up much faster than the yields. So why is that obviously going to be the case whenever the yield curve is upward sloping? So if we go back to our picture here. Um, if we go back to our picture, if the yield curve were completely flat, what do you think the forward yields would be? This is just common sense, just to see if you have any idea what's going on. If you think about batting averages and how somebody's average changes each time he bats, if the yield curve is flat, like in 2006, the forwards are going to basically be flat. But if the yield curve is upward sloping, then the forward yields are going to go up much faster. So why is that? Okay, well remember, the yields, the, the, you know, When you do a five-year coupon bond, you're discounting all the cash flows, the previous four cash flows. You're using the same yield to discount them all. So if you go from year four to year five, okay, and you have to raise the yield a lot, it means, you know, like if you're a batter and your average goes up, it means the last thing you did was better than the average of what you've done before. So it's going to be even higher. You know, if, you, if your average was 300 and then you played a series against the Red Sox in which you did very well and your average went up to 320, in that series against the Red Sox, you obviously did even better than 320 because you had to average what you did then with what your previous 300 to get 320. So if the average sort of is going up, remember the yield is the same thing over the whole history. If when you take a longer history, the average has gone up, it must mean that the most recent thing went up really much more. Okay, so the four-year yield is sort of averaging the payoffs over the first four years, the five-year yield is averaging it over five years. So if that yield, the five-year yield has gone up, what happened in the fifth year must have gone up a lot to bring the long run average up, okay? So that's why the, the yield curve is going to go up much faster. Okay, so we know now to summarize, everybody can look at these pictures every single day. From these pictures, they can deduce the pies. That's the crucial variable in the whole economy, the pies. But a second crucial variable is the forward yields, the 1 plus IFs, which you can just get by the pies. Now, why are the 1 plus i f's so important? We know the pies are critical because they evaluate every project by multiplying the cash flows by the pies. Why are the forwards so important? The forwards are so important because suppose you believed that, so the forwards, let's go back to what we got. 
Okay, so let's uh, just look at the, number, the numbers here. Here are the forwards, remember? Down here. Okay, suppose I said to you, you tell me, you don't know anything about the economy maybe, but you can read the newspapers and do mathematics like we've just been doing. What do you guess the interest rate's gonna be in year two? So this is the zero year forward, the one year forward, the two year forward, the three year forward, and the four year forward. If I say in year two, what do you think the interest, guess what you think the interest rate's gonna be, what would you guess? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Right. I could do this real interest rate by doing it for tips. Fisher would say, do that. Trouble is that tips are not traded as they're becoming more and more freely traded in the market. They used to be traded very. Uh, people didn't want to trade them. So my classmate Larry Summers uh, introduced tips. Uh, treasury, no, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, and he, you know, announced this was a fantastic idea and it was going to change radically the whole markets, and then nobody traded them, and they, they offered astronomical uh, interest rates, real interest rates, to get anyone to buy them, and so they were nicknamed, it's really bad on camera, but their nickname became totally illiquid pieces, of, and so that was, so, so, <laughs> <laughs> the market has not used the tips to do most of its pricing. It uses the treasury bonds. But yes, Fisher would say if the tips were a reliable market, you would uh, use the tips to get the real interest rate. And that's really what you should care about is the real interest rate, not the nominal interest rate. But we're using the treasuries here to get the nominal interest rate. However, you've now just dodged my question. My question was, if I asked you to predict on the basis of the yield curve in this example and what we've been able to deduce, what would you predict the interest rate was going to turn out to be two years from now, the one-year interest rate, what would you predict? Yeah. The market which forward rate? Um, next. Sorry, year, year two. In year two, what do you think the interest rate will be between year two and year three? Year two it's today, and we're asking, what do you predict the market rate of interest will be in year two between year two and year three? Okay, and I2F happens to be right here, 5%. Okay, so that's the forward. So 5% you'd predict. Okay. okay, so let me refine that a little bit. If the world were one of total certainty, so everybody trading today had a perfect forecast of what was going to happen in the future, then of course the forward rates in the market today would have to be exactly equal to the forward interest rate. Because suppose that you knew for sure the interest rate was going to be 4% in year two. How could the market get to a 5% forward? That means that some guy is promising today, I'll give you a dollar in year, you give me a dollar in year two, and I'll give you a dollar five in year three. And we're agreeing to that deal. But that's a ludicrous thing for him to do, because when he got to year two, uh, to year uh, two, right, when he got to year two, he could simply, t if he knew for sure what was going to happen in the future and that the rate was going to be um, 4%, he would just, uh, oh, I said it backwards, what an idiot. suppose he knew for sure the rate was going to be 6%, he would be a, uh, oh yeah, if he knew for sure the rate was only going to be 4%, he'd be a fool for promising to give the guy 5% today, because in the future, when he got the dollar, what would he do with it? Put it in the bank and get a dollar four next year? That wouldn't cover his promise. He'd be screwed. Okay, so if he knows for sure that the rate two years from now is going to be 4%, the forward 
price would, rate would also have to be 4%. So to say it backwards, if you assume everybody knows for sure what's going to happen in the future, then the forward rates had, had better, would be exactly equal to what everyone is expecting to happen in the future. To say it slightly differently, if you happen to be the one ignoramus in the world who didn't know what was going to happen in the future, but you knew that everybody else who was trading on the market did know what was going to happen in the future, and you saw a forward rate of 5%, then you could deduce, even though you were an ignoramus, that actually two years from now, the interest rate was going to be 5%. Okay, so it's just what you said, but just said a little bit more precisely. We're assuming here perfect certainty about what's going to... We're assuming the traders who trade today all are completely convinced of what's going to happen in the future. Okay, so let's go back to our picture now, um, the picture of the zero yield curve. So what do you think this blue curve means? What are the traders convinced is going to happen in the future? Assuming the traders... So w w the second half of the course is going to be dealing with uncertainty. We're now assuming, like Irving Fisher, that everybody trading today has no doubt about what's going to happen in the future. So what, is, what do we think the... Uh, what do you think these traders think about these prices? What, about the interest rates? We're now in the world today, this is September 30th, it's today, that's this curve. What do you think traders, what does this curve mean? Making the assumption that traders today are convinced about what's going to happen next, you know, in the future 10 years and 30 years, what do we know that they are convinced of? Yep. That interest rates are going to go up and go up a lot. They're not just going to go up to 4% because that's the, four, that's the, you know, the 30 year yield, they're going to go up. The, the forward rates are going up much faster than that. So we could have computed what they think. So they think rates are going to go way up in the future, okay? Much higher than that because you're starting so low. So you're going to have, you know, you're staying low for a while. So the rates have to go up the forward rates really sharply to pull the average that high. So people are convinced that rates are going to go up in the future. That's what that tells you. And why would they be convinced of that? Well, for the two reasons that you gave at the beginning. One of you said the market is going to get more productive. Irving Fisher has already told us that when the market gets more productive, you know, you're more optimistic about what's going to happen later, the real interest rate goes up. And if, the, if inflation's constant, the real interest rate goes up, the nominal interest rate goes up. The other possibility is that the real interest rate stays the same, but there's inflation in the future. The real interest rate plus the inflation is the nominal interest rate. That's another explanation for why people might expect the nominal interest rate to go up. Okay, so you know that uh, the market is predicting rates going up, and the two obvious explanations, according to Fisher, is that either the inflation is going to go up or the real rate is going to go up. And why might the real rate go up? Well, there are a bunch of reasons, but most likely because productivity is going up. Okay, so I got one more surprising conclusion to end this. Okay, so if you were certain about the future and you had a uh, you had a five-year, you took the five-year coupon bond, could you tell me what the price of the five-year coupon bond was going to be next year? How would you figure that out? Assume that everybody is convinced that the five-year coupon bond, that, the, that they, they know the future for sure. So therefore, from the zero curve, I erased my graph. This is the last question, so I'll let you go as soon as you answer this. You need to answer this to do the problem set. Um, uh, oh, wrong graph. Shit. Sorry. Okay, it's only take one second to answer this. Okay. I'm telling you now that this is what everybody's looking at in the morning, okay? These numbers, they're getting all the forward rates and stuff like that. They're making all the deductions we made. Now, if you suppose that those people are convinced, they don't have any doubt about what's going to happen in the future. Because they don't have any doubt about what's going to happen in the future, you can infer from these prices what they think about the future. So the question is, can you infer what the price of the five-year treasury, which is now 100.5, that five-year bond is 100.5. Next year, it'll only be a four-year bond. Do we know what its price is going to be next year? Yep. Yeah, you can take the cash flows for year two, three, four, five. Yep. Times them, uh, or multiply them by that time. So that'd be by what pies? That you yeah, just... Those pies, but those pies are something slightly different from those pies. It's going to be a year later, remember. And what would that, how would you get that? Yep. Yeah. 
Okay, so what you both said is absolutely correct. Unfortunately, we're two minutes, uh, we're ending now. So let me just end by saying, in the problem set, that's exactly the question. What is the five-year coupon going to be priced next year? If there's a world of certainty, you're going to know what all the interest rates are in the future. And if you know what all the interest rates are in the future, obviously Fisher tells you you can figure out what the price is. However, to get the exact formula would take a few minutes, and I unfortunately am a few minutes behind, so you're going to have to figure out what the right formula is. But it's what he said and what you were getting to. <laughs>